Hello viewers, welcome to this episode of Tata Katha season 1 wherein we are going to discuss ethics, values and corporate governance and I am joined again by Shashank Shah, the renowned author of the best-selling book, The Tata Group. Hi Shashank. Hello Vish, it's great to be back on uh, Tata Katha season 1 under the banyan tree umbrella and uh, the shade of the banyan tree and its rustling leaves give interesting experiences to the viewers. Pleasure having you here, Shashank. In an age and time when we have seen a lot of promoters and a lot of companies uh, running away from India, going to countries which have non-extradition uh, treaties with India, and a lot of promoters landing up in jail, one company and one institution that has stood the test of time has been the revered house of Tatas. And in this episode, uh, we are going to discuss on ethics, values, and governance. And therefore, Shashank, my question is, that we have seen that the group's institutionalized set of ethics and values have withstood that sort of competition and have also withstood compromised players. And therefore, how do you think that the Tatas have been able to ensure such high standards of governance across the past 150 years and across multiple leaders at the helm? Right. So that's a very uh, important question, I think, and I'm glad we're covering it in the second episode itself, because in some way or the other, ethics and values uh, from the very identity uh, of the Tata group. Uh, for example, uh, the mission. Uh, the mission uh, focuses on uh, improving the quality of life of the communities they serve uh, through long-term stakeholder value creation based on leadership with trust. So there are three distinct areas which they wish to focus on. Uh, one is improving the life of communities they serve globally. Uh, they want to focus on long-term stakeholder value creation, uh, unlike the usual focus on shareholder wealth creation. Uh, interestingly, the new uh, purpose of the corporation uh, proposed by the Business Roundtable uh, uh, in the USA, uh, one of the most high-profile association of CEOs uh, in America, have proposed that uh, uh, corporations need to focus on long-term stakeholder value creation, of which shareholders is just one of the five they have identified. So Tatas have been looking at this proactively for decades, a trend which has come up through the World Economic Forum as a stakeholder capitalism as recently as 2020. And the third part of the mission is based on, is focused on leadership with trust, which is also kind of a tagline. So the leadership with trust has two parts to it. Uh, one is the end objective and the other is a means to that end. So what is the end? Leadership. Leadership in all ways, leadership in the industry, leadership with uh, respect to uh, various stakeholders and how well you do with them, etc. The means to that is with trust. So this forms the undercurrent of Tata's approach to business, but it's not something which is new. Uh, the whole recycling of wealth and prosperity uh, between the firm earning the profit and the people who gave it the profit in the first place has been a core approach uh, uh, of the business group. Um, an approach which was articulated way back uh, in the 1890s uh, by Jamsedji himself. Uh, he often said uh, that what comes from the people has to go back to them many times over. Uh, it was again repeated in the 1960s by J.R.D. Tata and again in 1990s by Ratan Tata. In different words, I'll bet, but the consistency of the message has been the same. And I think uh, uh, ethics and values of the group go back to the founders' value systems, uh, the era of Jamsedji Tata. Uh, in fact, it's important for the viewers to know that where did Jamsedji get his sense of values? Uh, 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 he belonged to a, a family of priests uh, belonging to the Zoroastrian or the Parsi faith, uh, one of the smallest communities in India with a population of about 50,000 people but have made phenomenal contribution to the country, its economy and its social life over the last uh, millennium uh, since they landed on the shores of Gujarat uh, while they were escaping persecution in the erstwhile Persia, which is now Iran. So the, uh, the priestly values uh, of, uh, of uh, Jamsedji were not connected with rituals, but with the core three words which define the Zoroastrian faith. Humta, Hukta, Hubrashta. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds. These are the fundamental values that Jamsedji brought into his business. And he said that the society 
is not another stakeholder of the firm but is the very core purpose for which a corporation exists imagine talking about society being the purpose of existence or the raison d'etre of corporations 140 years ago it's so much of uh, a pioneering thinking much 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 ahead of its time centuries ahead of its time when today through csr there is some form of social responsibility that has brought in jamsed ji mentioned that society is a very core of a corporation in fact a corporation exists for creating this kind of positive value for the society and from this has emerged their vision or their uh, tagline of leadership with trust uh, which was espoused by the subsequent generations as well uh, whether it was uh, and and it was not uh, lip service it's important to note that this was something uh, this was done very tangibly uh, jam the dorab ji tata jamsed ji's elder son i spoke about it last time he mortgaged his family jewelry to pay wages leadership with trust he established uh, the, the sdtt the sir dorab ji tata trust and his younger brother ratan ji sir ratan ji tata jamsed ji's second son he also bequeathed his wealth to the sir ratan tata trust so these two collectively hold almost or held almost 85% of tata sons uh, which for some reasons have come down to 66% i'll share a little more details on that in one of the uh, future episodes as the our context whenever the context emerges but it is this value of giving back to the society many times more than one has received which was consistently prioritized during grd's years at the helm uh, it was an era of uh, nationalism and contributing to the making uh, and the building of a new and independent india this this was uh, the guiding uh, philosophy and inspiration for the group in those decades often grd said what's good for india is good for tatas nation first company next self last that was the philosophy they operated with most in many ways it continues even till date uh, despite the despite the peak of the license raj and the corruption associated with the bureaucratic and political systems of those decades uh, the tata companies under grd uh, constantly abided uh, by the group's values uh, which were ethics uh, transparency and trust however as we saw in the last episode <laughs> with respect to a change in the governance structure there was also a change in the way in which these values were to be institutionalized or practiced uh, ratan tata when he became the chairman he realized uh, that uh, he needed to institutionalize these values so that in the future whether there is a tata or not at the helm of affairs the tata values which have been the guiding light of the group for nearly 125 years when ratan tata became chairman continue for several centuries to come and for that he established or the group established what was called the tata code of conduct a tcoc uh, they they uh, identified five core values uh, that the group stood for uh, integrity understanding excellence unity and responsibility uh, these are the five core values of the group as defined under the tcoc and every employee and director of a tata company who subscribed to the bebp remember we discussed the bebp uh, business equity and business promotion agreement had to sign the tcoc uh, the tata code of conduct and abide by it in letter and spirit this meant that each of the 725000 tata employees are tcoc signatories making it one of the largest uh, corporate code of, of followed in the world and uh, moreover every tata company ceo also had to submit an annual compliance report on its adherence to uh, bbb uh, which included as its two pillars one was the tcoc the tata code of conduct the other was the tata business excellence model and for this purpose the chief executive also acted as the chief ethics officer uh, imagine uh, in an era where usually ethics is outsourced uh, to uh, uh, some edish, uh, some uh, 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 specific talent or agency outside here the ceo is also a ceo he is not just the chief executive officer he is also the chief ethics officer and that gives uh, the priority that ethics uh, deserves uh, in the tata scheme of things 
Uh, in fact, in Feb 2021, as recently as uh, this quarter, uh, Ethisphere announced uh, that Tata Steel uh, is one of uh, 2020's uh, once world's most ethical company for the 10th time, and that too in the metals and infrastructure sector, uh, where ethics and fair play uh, are often called the last ball in the game. Uh, I think uh, more than anything else, the proof of the strength of the group values uh, is seen when the rubber hits the road. Uh, in recent years, uh, rather the last 25 years, whether it was the Tata finance debacle uh, or the repayment to Docomo by Tata Teleservices or the global acquisitions where the interests of the local stakeholders had to be prioritized. Uh, Tata Group has, uh, uh, to the best of uh, the knowledge of the observers, uh, tried its best uh, to abide by its core values. Uh, and I'm uh, because this is Tata Katha and it needs to have some stories. Uh, here I'll share a story of how TCOC uh, played a role in the recent years uh, where uh, we are talking about institutionalization of values uh, which are not driven by an individual and his aura but which become the responsibility of every member of the company and the group. So this is uh, the example of Tata Motors. Uh, Tata Motors and their collaboration with Marco Polo from Brazil uh, where they wanted to set up a bus manufacturing facility in Lucknow, uh, which is the capital of the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, one of the major assignments uh, for this collaboration was to manufacture buses for the Delhi Transport Corporation. Uh, and uh, they had the mandate of uh, completely changing all the buses to the contemporary CNG, compressed natural gas uh, mode, uh, under uh, Mrs. Sheila Dixit, uh, who was the then chief minister of Delhi. Uh, however, uh, the bus plant wasn't getting pollution control clearance from the Uttar Pradesh government, where that plant was located. Uh, the company had uh, promptly fulfilled uh, all the requirements of the government, and yet there was an inordinate delay. Uh, in my conversations with one of the senior uh, Tata Motor leaders, uh, he shared many of these facts with me. I had interacted with him uh, at the company headquarters in Pune. Uh, he shared with me how he had personally met uh, the chief secretary uh, of Lucknow, the chief secretary is the senior most officer uh, in, within the state bureaucracy. And uh, the bureaucrat uh, who spoke to him uh, uh, was concerned about the delay in giving the pollution control clearance, uh, but he expressed his inability as the decision was not in his hands. Uh, uh, Tata Motors leadership recognized uh, that there was the, an indirect approach uh, which the political powers then uh, were uh, following. Uh, to attract uh, some uh, quote unquote benefits uh, which they could gain from the company, uh, which was under tremendous pressure from their customer. Who was the customer? The Delhi government, the Road Transport Corporation. And uh, they had even uh, incorporated a penalty clause for delay in the delivery of buses. And uh, uh, so Tata Motors was on pressure from both the sides. Uh, and so they sought appointments even with the chief minister. Uh, but on both occasions, it was uh, denied. So it went on for almost four to five months. And every time uh, the, the Tata Motors leadership would go to the uh, bureaucracy in Lucknow, uh, they would say, all your documents are in order. We just don't know why uh, the permission is not coming, why the process is not progressing. This was the time uh, when the Tatas announced uh, that they would relocate from Singur to Sanan, the famous uh, uh, battle of, uh, for Tata Nano manufacturing facility in West Bengal. Uh, which is interest, which is interestingly now in the peak of the election uh, process. Uh, so the leader I spoke to uh, shared with me that uh, he tried uh, telling the Lucknow bureaucracy and the leadership uh, that uh, this is what can happen if they don't allow uh, Tata Motors to manufacture in Uttar Pradesh. Tatas will relocate the plant and if they leave, Uttar Pradesh will be the loser. Now the government was under pressure and after six months, uh, in the blinking game, you know the blinking game who blinks first, the bureaucracy finally blinked and clearances were received. Uh, and to cover up the loss of production, Tata, put, Tata Motors put in tremendous amount of extra work. They employed more uh, manpower, uh, they paid the penalty, uh, but they fulfilled uh, the Delhi Transport Corporation's orders uh, in the stipulated time. So they were willing to pay extra price, they were willing to get more manpower on board, they were even willing to pay penalty but they were not willing to compromise on the values which were uh, identified as 
non compromisable in the tata code of conduct so thus a substantial degree of institutionalization has happened now how do you ensure that this is done across 7 lakh 25000 employees mind you it's not a small number tata is the largest private sector employer in india in fact tcs is the largest private sector employer in india with 4 lakh 25000 employees and uh, they are also the largest employer of women in india with nearly 1 lakh 25000 of their employees being women so an issue on gender diversity which is often seen uh, in several tata companies leadership uh, has been substantially addressed uh, with respect to the diversity at various levels within the hierarchy so how do you ensure that a, such a large company with such large uh, employee base everybody is uh, pos uh, is as possibly aligns with the values uh, uh, there have been many occasions uh, in my conversations uh, uh, in several platforms because i have because uh, most of my observations are an outcome of my book on the tata group a lot of people say yes we know tatas are very uh, ethical they follow their values uh, but that's not true uh, uh, in all our experiences some of them have shared experiences in their industry where they did not find some of the data managers to be as upright as they thought they should be or they would be uh, but yes that is that that could happen on an individual or person to person basis so it's not possible to be omniscient and manage all of that but that which does not surface in the public domain and that's why i tell them okay then those things should be brought up uh, brought to the notice of the senior most leadership so when these things are not in the public domain there may be something happening which may not be Uh, to tata's own expectations but when these things come in the public domain that is when there have been no examples to the best of my knowledge where things have been shoved under the carpet and each of the ways they have dealt with crisis so whether it is the tata nano project or the controversy with the uh, with the opposition party in west bengal uh, at singur or it is the tata finance debacle each time anything is in the public domain it is addressed by them with utmost sincerity with respect to Uh, the tcoc uh, in fact uh, how does the uh, group convey its commitment to the values it holds dear to all of the employees this was a question asked to mr ratan tata uh, at the annual conference of the exim bank in usa in 2016 and mr ratan tata gave a very insightful uh, and a very practical answer uh, he said you cannot vouch save the dna of every single person you hire in case of tatas over 700000 people however you can show your commitment to value systems and ethics by how you deal with an errant employee when he wears away in my time which means in his time he said we have been absolutely hard on employees no matter who it was you broke the code you left the company unquote so this is the kind of commitment he himself had towards ensuring that there is superlative commitment to the tcoc guidelines among all employees uh, whether it was the md of tata finance or it was uh, some uh, vendor or some employee in one of the tata companies if things didn't did uh, feature in the public domain or were brought to the notice of the top leadership in most occasions they have prioritized their values over any other expedient uh, opportunity so that i think uh, needs to be uh, reflected on and is a very valuable insight for managers entrepreneurs uh, passionate startup uh, guys who who should be looking at this with as much uh, commitment as they do uh, their business plan or the way they'll get their uh, sources of funding or the way they'll win over their customers because if the binding glue if the unseen roots are not strengthened if they are not nurtured nourished and protected then the tree when it grows big when it grows heavy with lots of fruits when it grows and spreads its branches far and wide with lots of leaves uh, it will not be able to take the burden because the roots which are your values and ethics which are unseen wouldn't have gone deep enough thank you shashank it's interesting that you must speak about ethics and values in terms of business plans and that too of startups i wonder how many of them have projected the kind of losses that they are making today 5 years back when they had presented their business plans to investors but i think that's the topic of another discussion uh thank you so much for your insights on uh, what the tata leadership has done over the years to instill these values across different companies across different individuals and the kind of corrective actions that the company has taken in terms of uh, employees who have not followed the code uh, 
Uh, also, this example that you have given to us of Tata Motors and the issues that they had with the UP bureaucracy and uh, the stance that they took that in case it is not met, uh, in case the licenses are not given, then they will have no choice but to move out of UP. And it is the state that is going to be a bigger loser. Uh, that I think is a testimony to the kind of uh, values and leadership that the company has propagated over the years. Thank you so much for that. My second question is that Shishank, we know that the Tata Group is one of the most revered business houses in the country. We have seen that the group's institutionalized sets of ethics and values have withstood cutthroat competition as well as compromised players. How do you think the Tatas have managed to ensure high standards of corporate governance? Yeah, so that's a very uh, uh, important question, uh, especially for those uh, who are uh, who look at corporate governance more from a uh, compliance perspective. I think uh, with respect to the Tatas, it has been more so corporate governance based on culture than just compliance. In fact, the former finance director at Tata Sons, uh, Mr. Ishat Hussain, uh, when I'd interviewed him, uh, he said, uh, accord in, according to me or in my experience at the Tatas, uh, if in corporate governance, the niti or the policy is, is not enough. The niyat or the intention is equally important. So the intention backing the policy is the is the unique aspect to which will make corporate governance uh, truly uh, uh, exemplary in letter and spirit. Uh, very often, what happens is when we are very compliance driven, we look at ways in which we can maneuver through the existing system or the labyrinth of laws that uh, we have in India in abundance and see what how we can uh, have an escape route. Uh, but when your niyat or your intention is to follow the law in letter and spirit, because we are convinced and committed. Uh, to the nation and its well-being and not just to the corporation and its profits we would fo be following corporate governance in letter and spirit so i think with respect to all the leaders within the tatas whether it is uh, jamsed ji darab ji jrd uh, before mr saklatwala and mr ratan tata and uh, now mr chandrasekharan also i think uh, what is being the guiding word is walking the talk uh, uh, I, at least uh, for the first four because mr chandrasekharan is the incumbent so he's just a few years into his role, but uh, the others have uh, finished their roles so over uh, their entire duration of their leadership. I think walking the talk uh, is what stood out and is what was the greatest exemplar of the priority given to corporate governance uh, at a very critical times uh, in their uh, uh, in their journey of leadership at the helm affairs uh, at, at the Tata Sons or the Tata Group. Uh, I'll share uh, two examples uh, uh, to show how. Uh, they could have maneuvered through the corporate governance. In fact, there were two opposing views within the group uh, for each of these situations. And yet they went for what was uh, corporate governance in letter and spirit. Uh, uh, one, of course, example is of Tata Finance, the debacle uh, when the company was eventually shut down. And then we have Tata Capital now. Uh, but I've mentioned that on several platforms. Uh, so I'd like to encourage uh, the viewers to look up my articles on LinkedIn or even on YouTube where I have a channel, uh, Dr. Shashank Shah videos, uh, where I've posted several of these short anecdotes, not just from the Tatas, uh, but several of other companies uh, that I have researched. And you'll find very valuable insights there too. Uh, but here I'll share another example, uh, which is of Tata Tele Services, uh, one company uh, in a very, very promising industry, uh, which did not succeed. Uh, uh, today, uh, Reliance has been able to create such a phenomenal brand value through Geo, uh, which is in the telecommunication space and has become uh, at par an important business for them uh, with their energy business. Uh, but Tata's, despite uh, the initial advantage they had, and for several reasons, were not able to leverage uh, uh, on, on their uh, expertise, uh, their capabilities, their first mover advantage. And Tata Tele Services has not been the success it could have been. In fact, it has been an out. It has been a failure in the final analysis of things. Uh, but let's just look at what happened with Tata Tele Services uh, in in terms of governance and how uh, uh, Tata Sons dealt with each of those issues. Uh, so let's go back in 1996. Uh, Tata Tele Services uh, was uh, the, the Tata Sons venture uh, in the telecom sector. Uh, they had nearly about 37 percent of stake uh, in Tata Tele Services, Tata Sons. And a decade later, in 2009, uh, NTT Docomo, uh, the Japanese telecom player, uh, picked up a 26 percent equity in the company uh, for about 13,000 crores. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, Tata 
had a subscriber base of about two and a half crore Indians uh, across about 20 circles. And uh, Tata Docomo, the joint entity of Tata Teleservices and NTT Docomo, uh, had the aspiration of reaching the top three spots in India, uh, which was then the world's second largest and the fastest growing mobile phone market in the world. Uh, however, but there were several issues, uh, as I mentioned, operational issues, competitive issues, regulatory issues, uh, that this venture was not successful. Uh, in fact, there have also been allegations of wrongdoing by several vested interests and peers uh, during the 2G scam, uh, which were eventually disproved by CBI investigations. So Tata Teleservices uh, has been known for several uh, uh, wrong things, which it should not have been circumstantially. Uh, while they have been given the clean sheet by CBI, but that also has had some kind of an impact on the company on hindsight. But uh, what we are talking here is about the governance bit. And by 2014, uh, the company's losses had wiped out its net worth. Uh, can imagine the quantum of losses uh, they had made uh, within about uh, 20 years of their existence. Uh, the same year, uh, Docomo decided to divest its stake in this joint venture. And uh, this was acquired by Tata's uh, 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 at about 1.2 billion after a prolonged arbitration process. We know what happened uh, in those years. In fact, within the Tata group, there were two opinions. In fact, one of the uh, uh, key areas where there was a difference of opinion uh, between uh, Mr. Mistri uh, and uh, Mr. Tata uh, was on the, uh, the divestment issue of Docomo because the government of India rules or the RBI rules had changed in the years uh, subsequent to the original agreement between Tata and Docomo. So there was this faction within the group which believed that uh, we should be going by the change rules uh, uh, under the Indian legal system. Uh, where there was this other faction under Mr. Tata who believed that no, uh, Tata's must uphold the original word given to Docomo uh, for, uh, uh, for the option to divest from the joint venture. And uh, after Mr. Chandrasekharan came in as the chairman of the Tata group, uh, this was one of the first decisions uh, that he took uh, with respect to Docomo. Uh, in fact, by 2017, which is when uh, Mr. Chandra took over, uh, Tata Teleservices debt had increased to nearly 30,000 crores. Uh, and the interest could not be serviced uh, by the earnings of the company. And so uh, Tata Sons decided to pare down the debt by about 50%. Uh, being a 55% shareholder, uh, the, uh, uh, they decided to put in the money uh, though other shareholders were not willing to do so. And uh, Tata Teleservices was to use those funds purely for debt repayment. They wanted that this money should not be used for any, any attempt to revive the company, but to pay back the debt that the company owed, which was nearly 30,000 crores. And uh, Tata Sons also negotiated uh, on behalf of the company uh, with the lenders. Uh, most viewers may not know that the Tata's enjoy a phenomenal goodwill with the lenders uh, because of their uh, fantastic track record across industries, across geographies. And that plays a very important role in the funding lending market because the goodwill and the track record of the one who is taking the funds is what uh, is a very important factor while uh, uh, negotiating or renegotiating the terms. Uh, by 2017, uh, the consumer mobile business of uh, Tata Teleservices was merged, as we know, in a cashless deal with Airtel and uh, along with uh, additional access to Spectrum, almost 4.2 crore customers uh, were handed over to Airtel and uh, they also had to absorb about 5,000 employees of Tata Teleservices. And uh, in January 2018, Tata Group paid 17,000 crores to a consortium of banks for the debts of Tata Teleservices uh, with an assurance of paying the remaining 6,000 crores in a separate installment. And for that, they had issued corporate bonds. Tata Sons issued corporate bonds to raise the funds. Remember, the responsibility was of Tata Teleservices. Tata Sons was not the only uh, owner of the Tata Teleservices. As we discussed, they paid back uh, Tata Docomo and then eventually became a 55% shareholder. And yet 45% shareholders were outside Tata Sons. And yet Tata Sons took the total responsibility of paying back. and. It uh, stood by their operating companies in difficult times, which was a very important element of corporate governance at the group level, the relationship between the group companies and the group headquarters and the responsibility of group headquarters 
with respect to fulfilling the responsibilities of the group companies with various stakeholders was very evident in this entire scenario uh, they took over the financial responsibility of its operating company uh, in this case due to non performance uh, if you look at the tata finance is due to financial demeanor and in both those cases it was a rare example where the holding company went beyond legal mandate to ensure its goodwill is maintained value systems retained and governance standards upheld this is a great example of synergy uh, between holding and operating companies under adverse circumstances and where corporate governance can be of uh, can be and should be followed in letter and spirit so here is an example uh, which is be known to people which is in the public domain because all of this happened in the public domain the fundraising the realignments the repayments etc now i'll quote another example which is all which also falls in the domain of corporate governance but will not come in any discussions on corporate governance because it is nothing to do with compliance here it has everything to do with culture which tata holds in a substantial uh, primacy uh, and this i'm going to talk about uh, tata's flagship company and its contemporary cash cow tata consultancy services and uh, it goes back uh, almost uh, 17 18 years in 2004 may uh, the month in which uh, the atal bihari vajpayee led uh, nda government lost the general elections and the bsc sensex nose dived from an all time high that time about 6250 points to about 4300 points and in this bear run kind of a bear run and kind of an unfavorable situation tcs decided to go public with its ipo in june 2004 so imagine you are going for your ipo for one of the most promising companies in the group at the most unfavorable times uh, in fact uh, by 2003 tcs had already become india's first billion dollar software company and uh, uh, it was a much awaited ipo in fact it was anticipated several years earlier but its timing raised apprehensions among investors and analysts alike now why did they not go for this uh, ipo about half a decade earlier which was a far more promising time both for the economy as well as for the global it industry uh, because it stocks were uh, their valuation was skyrocketing uh, if tcs uh, would have been floated as an independent company uh it would have been floated as an independent company uh, uh 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 in those years until it was until then it was operating as a division of tata sons but if it would have been floated as an independent company during that period it would have had a phenomenal start in the as a public limited company uh in fact the promise at that point in time can be understood from a fact uh, that a single e-commerce company like amazon with only a few thousand employees in those years had commanded a greater market capitalization than the entire steel industry in the united states of america which had nearly 1 million employees and that's why there was a lot of pressure uh, from corporate watchers and market analysts uh, on tata sons to consider listing tcs in those years uh, they even provided the kind of valuation uh, that tcs enjoyed in the market for example a uh, credit swiss first boston had valued tcs at about 20 billion dollars in those years half a decade before it was actually uh, the ipo was launched that was about 1999 and in, in in the dollar rates about 97000 crores uh, was tcs valuation uh, in mid 1990s now let's compare this to a situation which tatas were facing in mid 1990s the capitalization of the five or big uh, five or six big tata companies was about 20000 crores so with a 97000 crore valuation tcs if it would have been uh, launched in the public uh, market at that time uh, tata sons would have been able to uh, take every single listed tata company uh, and become debt free tata steel tata motors tata chemical tata power all of this the in fact the full ownership could have been of uh, tata sons all the debt could have been repaid this was also priority area for mr ratan tata uh, and uh, then vice chair when mr sunawala even mentioned this to him uh, that uh, the analysts have uh, uh, repeatedly highlighted the opportunity that lies before us as tcs 
uh, and uh, IPO should be considered in the uh, bullish markets that we are in. Uh, but Mr. Ratan Tata had a very different uh, mindset. He turned it down. Uh, he said uh, uh, that uh, it's very obvious that uh, there is a bull run, there is a bubble in the IT market and it's being built up. And now uh, if a TCS is listed, uh, we'll certainly get a ridic ridiculous valuation. But three to four years down the line, the bubble will burst and the shareholder will still be holding on our stock. And when they will receive dividend and what they will receive as dividends will be in no way, will, will in no way compensate what they have invested in our stock. And they will remember this and hold it against the Tatas that the Tatas did not look at the well-being of the shareholders. And as promoters, we do not want to exploit the market because of a short term situation. This is what Mr. Ratan Tata believed in. This was the reason and this is not in the public domain. This has come out of my extensive research and interactions with the close set of people who were involved in the decision making around these things at Tata Sons in those years. And uh, uh, this, this also is uh, very pertinent uh, to, uh, uh, to note, uh, in fact, the definition of character I'm always reminded uh, of the definition of character, uh, which uh, Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, had given to his daughter, uh, Indira, uh, Indira Prayadarshini Nehru then, and Indira Gandhi later on in, in one of his letters uh, as to, the, to his young daughter, Pandit Nehru had said, the true character is that with what one does when nobody's observing. You are your true character, or rather your true character will be evidenced from the fact as to how you behave, when nobody is observing you. Here, nobody was observing the Tatas. Nobody was thinking of the mindset they had. Nobody was no knowing of the reason why they did not go for an IPO at the most promising commercial opportunity. And yet they did what was right and what was their priority for the governance, uh, corporate governance principles, which they felt uh, they should abide by. Uh, the rest is history. We all know uh, that uh, uh, when it was finally listed TCS IPO uh, emerged as the biggest IPO in India in those years. And uh, today the story is very different. Uh, TCS market cap is at uh, 12 trillion rupees, which is 12 lakh crore. And uh, TCS often competes with Reliance Industries uh, limited uh, stock as the most valued company uh, on the Indian stock markets. And its value is larger than the entire Pakistan stock exchange put together. Uh, so that is the kind of potential uh, or the success uh, that uh, TCS has exhibited, has achieved. And uh, uh, this was not because uh, they were listed in a bull run or in a promising market, but because the inherent capability of a company to be successful is far more important than the timing at which its IPO is listed. And uh, TCS has bust this myth uh, uh, very, very obviously. Uh, and success that we see with respect to TCS uh, communicates that corporate governance can be gauged through such decisions when the principles are abided in during in letter and spirit. Uh, I'll conclude uh, this point uh, about this continued culture of governance, uh, which is evident uh, at uh, Tata Sons. Uh, in fact, during my conversation with Mr. Ishat Hussain, uh, which I just uh, mentioned a, a little earlier, he had worked with the four chairmen for about 35 years, which included uh, right from Mr. JRD uh, to Mr. Chandrasekhar. So I had asked him about JRD's style of governance and how he would be uh, taking decisions in the Tata Sons boardroom. And he reminisced uh, uh, his years as a young uh, manager working with JRD. And he said that JRD was extremely transparent. Uh, he believed in consulting people, even those who were much, much younger than him in age. He believed in giving them an opportunity to voice their opinion. In fact, he himself was asked by GRD on several board meetings that what is your viewpoint on this issue? And GRD ensured that uh, he was very careful in choosing the right people uh, to be brought on the board of directors. Uh, he did not believe in groupthink. He always wanted diversity of people, diversity of ideas, diversity of styles. And uh, that is what distinguished uh, uh, JRD's uh, style of leadership and governance. Uh, and there was another uh, uh, Tata leader of uh, the recent generation, uh, Mr. Mukundan, who is the MD of Tata Chemicals, 
who never worked with JRD Tata because much junior in age and experience. But when I asked him uh, about his uh, principle for corporate governance, he said that uh, you need people on the board uh, who have the same value systems, but these people need not be a part of a clique. There is a need for diversity. There's a need for open discussion. There is a need for transparency. And these literally govern the way the organization goes. So here I saw the two people belonging to two different generations, one having worked with JRD, one having never worked with JRD, one belonging to the previous generation, one belonging to another generation, both not being part of the same family, not being part of the same community, but believed in and ruled by the same uh, governance practices over a quarter century. So here, as I said earlier, the culture was far more important than the compliance. And that I think has been the guiding principle within the Tata group and their companies. Thank you so much, Shashank, for this. You know, the first time that I read about the TCS IPO story, first of all, I never knew about it till the time I read it in your book. And uh, when I read it for the first time, I was so utterly amazed that can someone actually do this in real life? Uh, these set of values to forego a valuation is unheard of. And after I read that, I spoke about it and discussed that with almost everyone and anyone that I could find in my office and in my friend circle, that do you know that this is actually the story behind the TCS IPO and how Mr. Ratan Tata, had he did not take, an, take that opportunity because he felt that was grossly unfair to the shareholders because he knew that this, that was, I think, the time of the Y2K bubble. And uh, uh, that, you know, this is something that is going to actually come to an end. And that is going to be grossly unfair to the people who are going to be investing in TCS at that point of time. Right. Thank you so much for this uh, Shashank. Extremely insightful as always. Uh, so friends, we are coming to an end of uh, another episode of Tata Katha. We will come back to you with far more interesting episodes. Stay tuned. Thank you.